Okay, good morning. My name is Martin Simons. I'm from the Netherlands. This is going to be a, a neutral talk, like you can see on my dress. And, um, well, I have a question first for you. Um, who works in an organization that does not use any automation tools so far? Oh God. <laughs> Nowhere to go to if you're going to crucify me, right? Mm -hmm. Who is using one tool in his, comp in his organization? One. Who is using two tools? Okay. Who is using three tools? Okay. Well, if I count all the hands, it's not 100%. So there must be companies using more than three tools. Okay. Is that so? <laughs> How very nice. Well, <laughs> How many tools are you using? Um, <laughs> Popper, Ansible, we use Jenkins on uh, uh, some self-written... Okay, um, scripts. No, um, kind of replacement for Terraform. Okay. And there was one hand over there. Yeah? Speak up. How many tools, when, uh, which tools do you use? Ansible, Jenkins. Jenkins. The, 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 that's one. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, and then? <laughs> okay, very fine. Terraform, <laughs> okay, great. So, it's a big lab then, right? Okay. Um, It's a bit of a makeshift kind of a presentation because uh, my new laptop doesn't want to talk to the HDMI, so I fell back to my old business uh, Windows laptop. Don't tell anyone. Um, well, like you see, um, um, uh, uh, <coughs> Um, yeah, it's a short one. I didn't mention my study. I did study economics on the University of Amsterdam. So if you want to see me, uh, you can see my profile just on LinkedIn. Key in webhouse and you will find me. Um, next. So I will start with a uh, quick glance at how it all started. It all started uh, with uh, Mark Burgess using uh, a CF Engine uh, 1 in 1991. Before that, there probably have been people that already did some uh, automation of repetitive tasks by using scripts, etc. Um, in 2002, CF Engine 2 emerged, which was a very popular uh, automation tool. Um, it is still in use in many corporations. It had, in one day, millions of nodes. CF Engine 2 was criticized from within CF Engine, but also from outside. The language was not consistent enough. So in that period, 2007 to 2008 and 2009, uh, there was a rapid sequence of events. Puppet emerged. Puppet looked. If I'm offending someone, please don't take it personally. Uh, Puppet more or less looked a bit like the syntax of CF Engine 2, so it was quite easy to step into uh, for puppets. Uh, to, uh, in 2009, CF Engine 3 emerged and it shied away quite a lot of uh, users because I myself found it very difficult in the beginning too. Um, and then something happened that uh, is really a, a break in everything what that happened before. That was the fact that um, <coughs> CF Engine uh, decided to become a big company and uh, hired a, uh, called in a VC in order to realize the big growth. Why? CF Engine had been very successful up to then. There were five men in the company, and they had $1 million in the bank, which is an incredible amount of money, because they had a big customer in the United States, and they, it was a bank, and they provided them with the money. Compare this to, for instance, ASML. ASML is the flagship of the Dutch economy. It's the, uh, whoever has a, a hands and cell phone or whatever, or a laptop, here in this room, probably has chips in the laptop or in the cell phone that are made by a machine made by ASML. ASML is the company that produces the machines that produce chips. 
They have 85% of the world market. And they make 6.4 billion euro a year, that was in 2015, of which 1.4 billion is net profit. So 14,000 people working in the company make 1.4 billion euro net profit a year. Fast calculation, then you know that is 100,000 euro per personnel, per member of staff per year, which is an incredible amount of money because many people, many companies are very glad if their staff make close to 80,000 euros a year. <coughs> Gross. So that's incredible. So CF Engine, in fact, even did better then. They managed to see uh, millions of nodes with their CF Engine 2. Why then, for God's sake, did they choose to hire a VC? The VC did, needed them, instead of the other way around. And Mark Burgess, I had a, a talk with him in the run-up of this talk, uh, once confessed to me and he allowed me to share this with you. He said, this was the biggest mistake I made in my life. There you go. CF Engine then was a Norwegian company with a Norwegian outlook. And they decided to go to the American market and become an American company. They did not realize then that there are different models going on in the two countries. The Norwegian have in fact the Scandinavian model, but okay, it more or less looks like the Rhineland model. The Americans on the other hand have the typical American outlook on the economy. So it's the Anglo-Saxon model. It's the Chicago school. It's the time to market. It's the return on investment. Uh, the short term is, is the quarter and the long term is a year. In the social market economy, it's another thing. The short term is one year and the long term is 10 years. Where in the Anglo-Saxon uh, model, the, the stress is on uh, how fast you get your, uh, the, the, the quick return on investment. The, the stress in the social market economy is continuity, continuity on the long term. So you have to exist after 10, 20 years, then you're doing a good job. So with that comes a totally different uh, way in which you treat people, in which you hire people. People that uh, go along the social market economy hire people to, to work with the company for over 40 years, which is no longer uh, uh, practice in the United States, for instance. People work somewhere for two to three years and then go somewhere else. So they started off with di different expectations, very different expectations. So where do you think? Any idea where the VC would stand here in this story? Chicago School, Chicago school right. So the, the, the quarterly uh, figures are the, are the holy grail. So you have managers running around with spreadsheets with all sorts of uh, numbers on them and they have to be green, otherwise it's not good. Right? That's the way they, 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 they manage a company. I guess they took a wrong turn, alas. It got worse, far worse. The VC came in. They took uh, leadership of the company. They had this management model. They were far away from the content of doing automation and do config management. They were managers, they were marketeers, they wanted to have a big shiny product and go conquer the market. That's not what Mark Burgess originally intended. Millions of dollars were spent on management and marketing. They devoured the money and they came back nothing or too, too not enough. It had serious consequences for the product too. No longer was it that uh, the quality of the product and uh, the focus of the product and uh, the theory behind the product was important. No, the product, product had to be sold, so the, the features that were to the, added to the product, th those were important. Even it had a, a bad effect on the technique of the product, so the features were more important than the, than the flaws that were in the product, and there were flaws. But it was more important to bring new features than to, uh, to patch the, the errors that were in the package. It was an open core model. Enterprise first. Enterprise brings in the money in the, in the philosophy of the people that then manage the company. 
Another thing that happened to CF Engine, and it had nothing to do with uh, the VC or the management, another thing that was that um, there was a clean break between CF Engine 2 and CF Engine 3. The DSL did not look like the old DSL. So it was very difficult for the people who used to use uh, CF Engine 2 because they had to learn it all anew. For me, it was a step two. I had to take a course. There was no migration path either. So in fact, the client base, the install base, was left astray, was left on its own. So they had to make a decision. What are we going to do? Well, then Puppet came in, and you know what happened. So it is in, it is in a way, they alienated themselves from their client base, and they alienated themselves from the community. And then came in, look, he had a very different approach. Mark Burgess ma admires him, because Luke has, has things that he cannot do. So Luke has the ability, he says, to listen to the community and give people what they want. And that is something Mark cannot do, be Mark is because Mark is a very principled guy. He wants to do it in the theoretically right way, otherwise he won't do it. And other people are a bit, well, you can negotiate with them. The move from Puppet of two Puppet from CF Engine 2 was easier than the move to CF Engine 3. So users felt it was very easy to start with Puppet. It was to their advantage. They also managed to make a deal later on with Red Hat, which made them, of course, made them a lot of business. And what they succeeded in is that they had a, a large, vast, enthusiastic, enthusiastic uh, community. They were open to the community, more open than the CF Engine Company, because the CF Engine Company was a very small development team that was a bit hard to negotiate with, according to some people that wanted to bring in features and stuff like that. Uh, Puppet also had this model of an open core and uh, an enterprise version, but it was Steve Engine was criticized for it, but Puppet came away with it. So, leadership. Uh, who's the, the, the guy in the top left corner? Tannenbaum, right. You know who Tannenbaum was? Tannenbaum was the guy that invented Minix, right? And Linus Torvalds, the one that is ordering a beer right there, uh, Linus Torvalds tried um, energetically to pursue Tannenbaum to, to build in stuff in his Minix so that it was usable to him. But Tannenbaum had an another approach and he had another goal with the product, so he was not inclined to listen to Linus Torvalds. He, was li well, he did listen to him, but he didn't give way. <laughs> so that's why Linus Torvalds um, became the master of his, and in fact, our, our destiny, and began Linux. In the top, you see, look, on the top right hand, who is that? <laughs> yeah, that's the, the Jenkins guy. He was presented to me as an example of someone who is a, a champion at managing a community. So he brought in Jenkins, listened to everybody that wanted to help him and everybody that needed his help. And he developed a fine system so that you could add plug plugins to Jenkins. And there are three layers, so uh, it is a very sophisticated system. That's Richard Stallman, you all know him. Of all people here on this screen, he may be the, the most principal guy uh, around. But we, we owe him a lot, because he is inflexible and he's very principled when it comes to licensing. We are having the great licensing model, models that we have today. We have to be very grateful to, to Richard Stallman. And that, of course, is Mark Burgess. Um, Mark is, of course, very visionary. And we talked about this talk. And um, while well, he more or less confessed that he um, was not able to, to do the work like Luke and 
Mr. Kawaguchi do, and Linus Torvalds, of course, too, to do the work to, to have a community around them that is able to, um, to make a, pro a perfect product together. So, here you have it. Of the people we saw on the previous screen, you see that we have ideological readers, like Burgess is one, Tannenbaum is also one, and Stallman is one. <coughs> and we have the community leaders, Torvalds, Keynes, and Kawakuchi. You need them both. Well, I, uh, it was a lengthy discussion I had with Mark. And Mark, uh, at, a go at a moment, said, well, I feel I'm a pragmatist. Are you serious? Yes, I'm serious. How come? Well, if there is a, if there is a problem somewhere, uh, I come in and, uh, well, make a real good solution that works generically. It can take a half a year, but okay. Okay. I found this funny website in which you can find the opposite of a word. So, water, fire, uh, cold, hot. But the word pragmatic is not so, not so easy. So if you key in the word pragmatic, you get a cloud of words like this. And I pasted this very set of words into the Skype conversation I was having with Mark. He said, oh yes, oh yeah, yeah. It applies almost, almost every word applies to me. So, <laughs> are you so pragmatic, Mark? I guess not. So, I already say this, said this, but where would we be without Richard Stallman, and where would we be without Linus Terhals? We have to be very grateful to those people, because they stood tall in their own way, and in fact help us. It is to our benefit. So, communities. Some people neglect communities. Other people know, on the left. They know the, the community is key to their success. If you're Mr. Tannenbaum, you don't care about community because you want to have your product. And the product has to be right in an academic fashion. And I guess many people feel that we belong a bit too much to the right, the sea avenging community then. Okay, how do you bridge the gap, which is a challenge? You have two very different kinds of people. You have the hands-on people, people that, that rush to a, to a keyboard and fix the problem, and you have the observing kind of people, like Mark Burgess is one. But you need them both, because there is a downside to any of these types. The downside of the hands-on guy is that you have a wilderness of hands-on solutions, pragmatic solutions, at a given moment it becomes unmanageable. If you have the observer, you may end up in a situation that the fire is raging and the one that is going to, has to extinguish the fire says, okay, this is not such a good construction, let me go to the, to the drawing board and make a better design. But the fire has to be extinguished, right? So, in this comes the delicate play. And most important display is your social skills. Are you able to deal with people? Are you able to deal with your own principles? So that comes in politics, that comes in diplomacy. You have to be nice to people. You don't have to be rude. It's very, very important, but also very difficult to be, to be polite to someone if you profoundly disagree. But you have to. There are interests. And well, Frankly, it is not given to everybody to be a diplomat or to be a, a, a politically uh, cunning person. Okay. This is a true story now. Sea Engine went through, through a very difficult period. And I know that from my own experience. Sea Engine all but collapsed in 2014. It was because uh, Sea of Engine was partly owned by a, ver uh, a VC, is a, uh, a capitalist, uh, uh, virtual, uh, I forgot the word, <laughs> virtual, uh, venture capitalist. And 
Um, they were owned by one, and there was a, a couple of companies in a, in a set of uh, a set one VC had, and this VC uh, decided to sell them all in a basket, right? And the new VC said, "Hey, that's nice. Let's all keep. Yeah, it's interesting too. I see vegetables. <laughs> I'll throw it away." So they pulled the plug. The lawyers came in. The accountants came in, so it was a very difficult story. I'm very glad the management then uh, decided and were able to buy back the company. So, they're making money again right now. Uh, an important decision was made. The error that was made in 2009-2010 in to, to beef up the company with managers and with marketeers. I don't offend these people, but I think they were right, the current people. Well, to lay them off. But some companies still are owned by a VC. Those VCs spend tens of millions of dollars to make these companies work. And it's, it's questionable whether the money, money is coming back. They're not social institutions, remember? Whenever you depend on a VC, you always are in danger, you always are in dire straits, but you, because you never know what can happen. If a third party owns your company, the third party itself can be in trouble. And then the, the party starts, right? We have it uh, in the Netherlands too, with software companies that were owned by, uh, partly by another company, the other company gets trouble because of another company, and then the party is on. You never know when it is going to happen, where it is going to happen, and what. All you know is the VC want their money back, and they want a return on their investment. They want everything, maybe even your skin. The business model. There are more or less, how do you type, two kinds of business model nowadays. We have the business model with the open core and the enterprise licensed uh, product. So that's the money making model. So see if engine do so and pop it. And there is this service model. Nomation do so and chef. So the product is free, but the company lives off uh, uh, of the, the services they, they deliver. So services mean uh, that you pick up the phone whenever someone is calling, that you do an implementation, uh, that you do a, a monthly or a yearly checkup. You never know, there are all sorts of contracts and if you want to know you ask the, the chef or the domination people. And I feel this is a better model. The downside of the open core and um, license uh, model is that there is always a play uh, around uh, repairing bugs, uh, fixing bugs, etc. Because the company lives off the licenses, so they have an obligation towards the enterprise people, the enterprise customers, to fix it. And fix it first. Or build in a new feature. It's more important than to fix a bug in the community version, right? So, it always is a bit of a tricky business. Uh, the service model, from my point of view, and what I see of it, the companies that are using it, doing it a bit better is, is the way to go and is more in line with the open source model than the enterprise model is. So, who are involved? Because this is the game. You have the venture capitalists, we call them, the companies themselves, the big clients that are influential. Governance. We didn't cover that, but it's an important one too. In fact, this is a bit what is not so official, but it is very important if you want to engage your com community and have them loyal to you. Communities. Well, and then inside companies. Managers. That's a difficult one. Because managers, many times, do not know what they're talking about. Just know the numbers. You can call them spreadsheet operators, if you like. <laughs> and they make silly decisions. I know a big bank in the Netherlands where they have a, a good CF Engine implementation. Comes a manager and he says, well, it's not so standard, right? We're using Reddit. We're going to move to Puppet. Because he wanted to standardize. 
Could have been the other way around. Suppose it was uh, he could have been, uh, go for, uh, gone for Ansel, uh, Ansible or for Jeff. But it's 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 a silly reasoning, right? You have the architects. Architects are sometimes people that are a bit too far away from the conflict management issues. You have the sysadmins. Many of you are sysadmins, I guess. And um, well, everybody knows. Um, how sysadmins can be, and you have the developers. Another big bank in the Netherlands did a very good attempt to, uh, to DevOps. So they turned their classical IT organization over into a DevOps organization. If you want to know more about this, just ask Chris. He worked there. They did a very good job because I worked there at the time. So you had this old-fashioned IT organization with developing teams and uh, operational teams. And those teams gave each other a hard job, always. So the, uh, the operational teams always tried to prevent something to go to production, and the developers always tried to push something to production, ready or not. So that was, in fact, a confrontation. This organization had this dramatic change in 2012 towards uh, DevOps. So all the people, the developers and the, uh, and the ops people were put in one team, a scrum team even, and we worked in an agile manner. Okay, not everything went right, but we did work in a uh, DevOps manner. We, they also went to use uh, Puppet over there. But one way or another, it didn't work out out there. Um, I will not go into the details, I will go into what happened then. Because I heard lately that they decided, the, the system administrator camp decided, to go and use Ansible instead of Puppet. So now you have two, two brands uh, running there. And I, I wonder, is it still DevOps right now? Or is it the one camp using Ansible and going their way and having uh, the, uh, the developers using Puppet and do it their way? I worked in an organization where they had uh, two products uh, next to each other, Puppet and CF Engine, and it didn't give me a good feeling. So. Sorry. <laughs> um, it was American Express. Someone tried to, to rob my... Uh, uh, to, to misuse my, uh, my credit card to, to buy dresses for 500 euros. <laughs> so they, they saw this, that's suspicious. <laughs> okay. Um, customers, so like the big banks and everybody else, have to, to manage this new situation. Because we have to realize that using Linux in big organizations like, uh, like the big banks is relatively new. When I came in at the bank in 2011, the L word, Linux word, was the shortest way to the exit. Because Lin uh, Linux was open source, so it was not safe, it was not secure, uh, it should not be used, it should be forbidden. I worked for the taxman's office in Apeldoorn, and we had a project which, was, which is called the, the, the Linux, managed, Linux Managed Platform. We worked for, on it for a year. And then came a security guy by, and he stopped the project because it was open source, it was not safe, it was not good. We had to use AIX. Okay, I came in, but in 2012, I met the first guy, he was from Belgium, by the way, and he was uh, swearing a bit because he had to install a package, and the package had to run on Linux, otherwise the, the vendor wouldn't support the package. So the bank... Uh, eventually said, okay, come in and we will uh, have this uh, package run on, on, on Linux. It was the first encounter of Linux in the bank. Half a year later, we had this uh, turnover of the organization, and the decision was made to build a new data center, and it had to be all Linux. All the applications in the bank had to be migrated from Sun Solaris or AIX to Linux. So how, that's how fast it can go. But it del delivers another problem, because how do they manage it? In, in, in the commercial product, managers were, were able to have uh, contracts with suppliers in order to support them. 
in the case of Linux, it's a bit more difficult. Okay, here comes Red Hat, so they will give you an enterprise version and support, but still it's a new situation to deal with. Managers don't like risk, especially the risk that they don't know or understand. So they are open to commercial types always. So if you're a smart seller, you go to the manager and you can sell them anything. The, the, um, so, and it automatically uh, drives you to big vendors. They want to be able to have contracts with big vendors, trustworthy parties, so that they are safe. They cover their ass, right? In the field, it's an all-out war. Wherever you go, suppose a company made a decision to use Chef or use CF Engine, there are always uh, people to try to get in, or people trying to get in from inside or from outside and change the course. It's always happening. I've never seen anything else. There is always discussion on what product you should use. And there never ever comes an end to this discussion. Uh, and I like, like I said, there are many automation tools for that reason alone in the company. I myself am convinced that you can do most of the work, for instance, by CF Engine. And for very specific tasks, you could use, for instance, Ansible. I worked at ASML in Eindhoven. They have a huge test farm. They bring up 100,000 machines. The machines live for half a day and, that, and then die again. They are only there for the results because those machines are used for tests. Well, you don't, do not want to bring up such a farm with CF Engine. You do it with Ansible. Another observation I made was that um, if you are going to use automation tools in your organization, you have to look at your organization because you will not be successful by only applying the technique in itself. You have to organize before you automate. My observation is that you're in a team, for instance a, a, an ops team, and you try to improve the, the situation of the platform. You try, for instance, to, to make it uh, better for application managers. But then the people around you, internal staff, most of the time step on the brake and say, oh, 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 that's not our responsibility. That's their responsibility. And by the way, we're going to give them a hard job. That's how it goes. So that's, those are the Chinese walls that uh, exist within the organizations. And you have to be a very strong and visionary manager if you want to change this, if you want to pr improve your organization and make full use of automation tool, of the capability you have with an automation tool, then you have to think about your organization and now about the, the Chinese walls in your organization. And what you see in organizations is that people work in a, in a department and are blind for whatever else happens outside the department. It's, it's true for everybody, it's true for architects, it's true for managers, it's true for system administrators, it's true for developers. That's why DevOps is so great. You bring all these people together, they have no ch chance to sit on either side of the Chinese wall. Conclusion. Um, there is no one best way, I feel, because the tasks that we have ahead of us uh, are so, va so variable. You can be in a bank, you can be at ASML, you can be in a small company, you can be in a big company, you can be in, a, in an internet service provider company, you can be in a clearinghouse. <coughs> the requirements you have in organizations can be very different. So it has an effect on the tool you choose. Um, like I said in the previous sheet, uh, successful automation requires uh, organizational changes. You cannot get around it. It's always necessary. You cannot stick to your old organization if you have a classical organization with a sysadmin team, developers team, network team, or whatever team. You need to have strong visionary management. Most of these projects in automation fail once. I did one in, uh, in Los Angeles for DirecTV. And they had a failure before they had a success. They needed failure in order to be successful because the manager then was a strong guy. We were, we were going to work in, a, in sort of a DevOps kind of fashion. Uh, session, uh, fashion. Uh, we were sitting um, every day at 10 o'clock around the table to see what was going on, what we achieved, what we did not achieve, where the roadblockers were, and it went smoothly. 
because he had an ID. He knew where he wanted to go to. And he included uh, application management in our task. Um, the last one is um, when it comes to the vendors, and it's all the, the companies that are there, some of them maybe already do so, but I feel not all, every company does so. Um, rather than have focus on your uh, financial results, what's, it's a silly plea in this capitalist world, okay. But rather than have you focus on the, the money, you should have the focus on your miss mission, like um, the kernel project style uh, of Linus Torvalds. I was in the, in, um, what was it called, the Linux Foundation uh, in Edinburgh in 2013, and then we had this uh, talk by Linus Torvalds, or an interview, he doesn't talk. And um, there was a question from the audience. The question was, uh, what is the plan, the future plan for, for the Linux kernel? Well, then Linus said, there is no plan. There's never been a plan, and there probably will be never be a plan. So, he's the guy that just focuses on the tasks that are ahead of him and organizes his community around it. So, his focus is the functionality of his kernel. So, I feel that it's very successful. And there can be a business model around it. And I feel the same counts for the, the automation products. Have your focus on your uh, mission and the results will come in. That's my personal conviction. Okay, I take questions if there are any. I don't think so. Yeah? Uh, so you talked about the two opposing business models, the uh, open core versus enterprise um, and then the service model. Yeah. Do you see a, a way to have a successful hybrid approach, say, for example? Uh, I didn't understand uh, too successful. Uh, it's it's my hearing, it's not your talking. Okay, hybrid approach. Yeah. So where you can have a, um, an, enterprise, an enterprise product an open core product and be able to sell support for the open core product as a, like kind of on a piecemeal basis. Yeah, that's in fact what I suggested to CF Engine already. It's better than only to have only the, the enterprise uh, approach and the open core. But I, I would prefer the service model altogether because there are downsides to have the, the, the enterprise uh, product. I understand it. it may be the American outlook to do it like that, but my, my vision is that the, the core product will always suffer from an enterprise product. But okay, it's a better way to have this hybrid than to have the, the naked uh, core and enterprise uh, solution. I agree. Is that an answer to your question? Okay. We'll see each other later on today. Yeah, thank you. Hi. It's not socialist economic model, it's a social economic. There's a big difference, right? <laughs> where, are you, where are you from, by the way? Uh, originally from former Yugoslavia. So oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so you may. <laughs> so you know what socialism is. <laughs> yeah. uh, but do you believe that this is a way to uh, sort of uh, bring, uh, bring this into a, uh, a project? Um, is this a way to? Well, the, the, the commercial, um, the commerce should always be, from my point of view, from the service that you make on the product. It is, the, the approach is to make a perfect product, making full use of the capabilities of the community. I was in this room in Edinburgh in 2013, and there were about two and a half thousand people around me. And just Linux asked a question at a given moment. He said, how many people have ever contributed to, the, to this kernel? Two-thirds of the population raised their hands. I go, my God. <laughs> so that's a community, right? So close to 2,000 people that raised their hand to say that they contributed to the Linux kernel, which is great, in fact. If I ask a question like that on, for instance, CF Engine, who contributed, I, see, I will see some hands, it's guaranteed, but it's not two-thirds. Yeah? And it's not 2,000 people. <laughs> okay. Um, well, thank you. Thanks. Okay.